One of the most hotly debated questions in science fiction is Kirk or Picard. But these arguments usually don't factor in their ships, likely because by all accounts the Enterprise D is far superior to Kirk's NCC-1701. Starfleet made a lot of progress in the time between making these two ships from the years 2245 to 2363. But what exactly is it that makes the next generation's Enterprise so dissimilar? So with that in mind then, I'm Ellie with Trek Culture here with the 10 biggest differences between Kirk's Enterprise and Picard's. Number 10. Size Although the two starships had very similar designs, the Enterprise D, Galaxy Class, was much bigger than its Constitution Class counterpart. Picard's ship was more than twice as long, measuring in at 641 meters, that's 2,103 feet, compared to Kirk's ship at 288.6 meters, or 947 feet, and was also made much bulkier around weak spots like the neck and the warp nacelle pylons. Although the number of people on both ships fluctuated, the original Enterprise never had more than 500 people on board, typically around 200, whereas the Enterprise D consistently housed a little over 1,000 people. Both ships were among the largest and most powerful of their times, but by the 24th century, even ships that were considered small, such as Voyager, were much larger than Kirk's vessel. Weirdly, in the Star Trek 2009 film, Kirk's Enterprise was redesigned and scaled up to be about the same size as a Galaxy class due to the size that they made the ship's windows on its 3D model. Number 9. Speed Comparing the maximum speed of both ships isn't really fair because although there was a writer's guide to calculate how long it should take the ship to travel anywhere, this guide was rarely consulted and by the time of the next generation, an entirely new system replaced it. In Gene Roddenberry's initial draft proposal, Star Trek Is, he stated that the maximum speed of the original series Enterprise was 0.73 light years per hour, which would mean it could travel Voyager's 70,000 light year journey home in about 11 years as opposed to 70, and Voyager was much faster than the Enterprise D. Part of this confusion comes because in The Next Generation and Beyond, new calculations were implemented and Warp 10 was defined as infinite speed, a seemingly impossible velocity that would allow you to occupy every point in space simultaneously. The speed of warp factors increased exponentially from 1 to 9 to 9.1, 9.2 and beyond, never reaching 10, as this would be infinite speed. The Enterprise D was established in the show as having a standard maximum warp factor of 9.5, and given the speed of 0.73 light years per hour, Scotty could apparently get the ship beyond Voyager's max speed of warp 9.975. It is safe to assume that this was merely a mistake, but maybe Scotty really was just a miracle worker. Number 8. Computer Systems Starfleet's computers have gone through numerous changes over the years. Touchscreens were not commonplace in the original series, and most computers were bulky and had very indistinct buttons and dials plastered all over. Their design harkens back to early computers from the 60s. Presumably, the set designers failed to anticipate how far computers would advance. In the next generation, we are introduced to LCARS, short for Library Computer Access and Retrieval System. LCARS is the operating system that all Starfleet uses in the 24th century, characterized by its bright colored borders separating different pieces of information, as well as its touchscreens, which greatly resemble the technology in modern smartphones. The design of the computers was not the only thing to change, however, as 23rd century starships operated with duotronic systems, whereas in the 24th century, they used isolinear cores. The differences between these two types of computers are not clearly defined, but it's safe to assume that the isolinear circuitry is much faster. Number 7. Holodecks Holographic communication devices existed in Kirk's time, as we see in the Star Trek Discovery episode The Vulcan Hello, but they had poor resolution, and at this time the holograms were merely 3D projections of people that could not actually be touched. They fell out of use before the original series, and it wasn't until about 100 years later that we started to see some advancement in the tech. The Next Generation's pilot introduced us to the holodeck, leaps and bounds beyond the holograms of old, able to render entire realistic worlds that fit within the confines of a small room, yet appear to stretch beyond the horizon. The holodeck employed an extremely advanced system of lasers, force fields, optical illusions, and anti-gravity to make the simulated worlds indistinct 
indistinguishable from reality. The creation of the holodeck was the greatest advancement in entertainment in human history, and by the late 24th century, they were on board nearly every starship in the fleet, every starbase, and even some people's homes. Number 6. Replicators the 23rd century predecessors to replicators, known as food synthesizers, operated on a similar principle. The main difference being that while replicators can rearrange individual atoms to create virtually any object, food synthesizers were more limited, only able to rearrange select amino acids and other substances available on board the ship to create meals. The invention of the replicator meant that the Enterprise D did not have to keep stock of individual ingredients for food, as nearly every meal could be constructed using miscellaneous particles in space. The replicators could also create weapons, clothing, and nearly anything else imaginable given enough power. Food synthesizer technology appears to be limited to rearranging organic matter. The operation of these devices was also very different. Replicators responded to voice commands, whereas people ordered meals from food synthesizers synthesizers by inserting a small program tape into the device. Replicators on the Enterprise-D freed up storage space, gave the crew more food options to choose from, and allowed for more long-distance missions as the ship did not need to constantly replenish specific ingredients. Number 5. Shuttle Bays and the Captain's Yacht both the original Enterprise and the Enterprise-D had shuttles on board that could transport members of the crew on special missions away from the mothership or land on a planet's surface. They were warp-capable and armed with phasers, but much slower and less powerful than a starship. The shuttles were stored, launched, and maintained in shuttle bays. Kirk's ship only had one shuttle bay, whereas Picard's had at least three. Interestingly, the Enterprise-D was also equipped with another small vessel known as a captain's yacht. Picard's yacht was known as the Calypso and was never used on screen, though you can make out the outline of it on the underside of the saucer section. It makes sense that Picard would barely use his yacht, as it seems more like a pretentious status symbol than anything practical. Number 4. Families on board one of the oddest changes from the original series to The Next Generation was that the Enterprise now inexplicably had families and children on board at all times, a fact that Picard himself expresses disagreement over in the pilot episode Encounter at Farpoint. The Enterprise-D even had a school and many children would spend years of their lives on the ship. This is terrifying when one considers how often the ship is threatened by aliens, anomalies, and other disasters. When the entire crew de-evolved into prehistoric animals in Genesis, all these children were affected too. They were subjected to memory loss in the episode Conundrum and nearly assimilated by the Borg in Q-Who, not to mention the near-weekly space battles. Clearly, a starship is no place for children. Starfleet in the original series was much more logical in this regard, treating starships more like military vessels than luxury cruises, only allowing civilians and children on board for short periods when necessary. Number 3. Cetacean Ops in Kirk's time, whales were extinct and humanity did not yet know of theirs and the dolphins' highly advanced intelligence. When the whales were brought back from the past to repopulate in Star Trek The Voyage Home and Starfleet discovered that they were sentient, they learned to communicate with them and formed an alliance. Many whales and dolphins, or cetaceans, would even join Starfleet, and in the next generation, some starships, such as the Enterprise-D, had an area on board known as Cetacean Ops, huge water tanks where cetaceans would use the their advanced brains and unique physiologies to assist the ship with navigation, greatly improving efficiency. We never got to see Cetacean Ops on the Enterprise-D, but in the Lower Decks episode First First Contact, the crew of the Cerritos pays a visit and is greeted by two adorable beluga whales in Starfleet uniforms. Number 2. Weapons Surprisingly, the weapons on Starfleet's ships didn't change much at all from the 23rd century to the 24th. Both Enterprises were equipped with photon torpedoes and phasers. It wasn't until the first invasion of the Borg when Starfleet began to develop more destructive weapons like quantum torpedoes and tricobalt warheads. Prior to this, the Federation had been experiencing decades of unprecedented peace. The Enterprise-D did have one major advancement to its phasers with the inclusion of phaser arrays, linear arrangements of phaser emitters that could fire from virtually any angle. This was a massive improvement from the traditional phaser cannons of Kirk's time, which could only fire in a very limited path. Number 1. Saucer Separation 
As mentioned earlier, the Enterprise D, as opposed to Kirk's ship, had a large number of civilians and children on board. When the ship was under attack, it needed a way to evacuate all of these non-Starfleet people to safety. And this was the rationale behind the Enterprise D's saucer separation. Saucer separation could be done with the original series era ships, but the procedure was dangerous and could not be undone except at a starbase. Perhaps the coolest yet most underused feature of Picard's ship, saucer separation could also be used to flank enemies, attacking them from two angles at once. Both parts of the ship functioned completely well on their own, equipped with warp nacelles, weapons and shields. It would have been nice to see more combat scenarios involving this manoeuvre. Saucer separation was only used in a couple of episodes for many reasons. Mainly, it's just because of the high cost of filming the model to do it, but also separation took a long time, as they had to wait for all non-Starfleet personnel to move to the saucer and the crew to split between the two sections. And that concludes our list. If you can think of any that we missed, then do let us know in the comments below. And while you're there, don't forget to like and subscribe and tap that notification bell. Also, head over to Twitter and follow us there at Trek Culture. And I can be found across various social medias just by searching Ellie Little Child. I've been Ellie with Trek Culture. I hope you have a wonderful day. And remember to boldly go where no one has gone before.